Revelation chapter 20. I'll start by reading that whole chapter. And I saw an angel come down from heaven, having the key of the bottomless pit and a great chain on his hand. And he laid hold on the dragon, that old serpent, which is the devil and Satan, and bound him a thousand years and cast him into the bottomless pit and shut him up and set a seal upon him that he should deceive the nations no more till the thousand years should be fulfilled. And after that, he must be loosed a little season. And I saw thrones and they sat upon them and judgment was given unto them. And I saw the souls of them that were beheaded for the witness of Jesus and for the word of God and which had not worshipped the beast, neither his image, neither had received his mark upon their foreheads or in their hands. And they lived and reigned with Christ a thousand years. But the rest of the dead lived not again until the thousand years were finished. This is the first resurrection. Blessed and holy is he that hath part in the first resurrection. On such the second death hath no power, but they shall be priests of God and of Christ and shall reign with him a thousand years. And when the thousand years are expired, Satan shall be loosed out of his prison and shall go out to deceive the nations which are in the four quarters of the earth, Gog and Magog, to gather them together to battle, the number of whom is as the sand of the sea. And they went up on the breadth of the earth and compassed the camp of the saints about and the beloved city and fire came down from God out of heaven and devoured them. And the devil that deceived them was cast into the lake of fire and brimstone where the beast and the false prophet are and shall be tormented day and night forever and ever. And I saw a great white throne and him that sat on it from whose face the earth and the heaven fled away and there was found no place for them. And I saw the dead, small and great, stand before God, and the books were opened. And another book was opened, which is the book of life. And the dead were judged out of those things which were written in the books, according to their works. And the sea gave up the dead which were in it, and death and hell delivered up the dead which were in them. And they were judged, every man, according to their works. And death and hell were cast into the lake of fire. This is the second death. And whosoever was not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, I thank you, God, for this word. Fitly spoken in due time, I pray, God, that you would use it according to your will, Lord, that you would be magnified in what happens here today. Be with your people. As you promised, where two and more are gathered together in your name, there are you in the midst in the area of prayer, and I believe also in the area of preaching. Help us today, Lord, and give us strength to perform your will, and we'll give you the praise and the glory. In Jesus' name, amen. Revelation chapter 20, I'm only going to be able to deal with, I think, the first half of this chapter. Uh, there's a lot of content here and uh, just a lot of things to deal with. And really two different topics, I believe. The first resurrection and the great white throne of judgment. So we'll deal with the resurrection right now. Now, verse 1 reads like this. It says, And I saw an angel coming down from heaven. So here's an angel coming down from heaven. It says, having the key of the bottomless pit and a great chain in his hand. Now, if you keep your finger there in Revelation chapter 20, I'm going to go to chapter 9, where you read of the fifth angel in verse 1. It says in Revelation 9 and verse 1, and the fifth angel sounded, and I saw a star fall from heaven unto the earth, and to him was given the key of the bottomless pit and he opened the bottomless pit and there arose a smoke out of the pit as the smoke of a great furnace and the sun and the air were darkened by reason of the smoke of the pit and there came out of the smoke locusts upon the earth and unto them were given 
power as the scorpions of the earth have power. And it was commanded them that they should not hurt the grass of the earth, neither any greed thing, neither any tree, but only those men which have not the seal of God in their foreheads. And to them it was given that they should not kill them, but that they should be tormented five months. And their torment was as the torment of a scorpion when he striketh a man. So back in Revelation 9, a star is given the key to the bottomless pit. And at this time, he's releasing tormenting locusts of judgment. He opens up the pit using that key, and that bottomless pit is where was contained these locusts with stings of scorpions in their tails, given an authority and a, and a job, really, to go and torment men five months as a scorpion that striketh a man. Verse 6, it says, And in those days shall men seek death, and shall not find it, and shall desire to die, and death shall flee from them. So we know from our studies to date that Revelation 9 contains a portion of Scripture of, of the judgment of God. As, as His righteous judgment and wrath is falling upon earth, this fifth angel sounds... And then is given a star, a star then is given, or an angel then is given the key to the bottomless pit. So call the star here back in Revelation chapter 20, clarifies and says, and I saw an angel. I believe these are the same creatures, the same beings, receiving that key to the bottomless pit. Back in chapter 9, he opened it for the purpose of doing, performing judgment. Here he opens it for a similar reason. Keep reading down in verse 2, and it says, and he laid hold. On that dragon, that old serpent, which is the devil and Satan, and bound him a thousand years. So first he opened the pit that judgment could come on earth via these, these locusts from the pit. Now he is taking that same key and a chain in his hand and laying hold on the dragon, laying hold on that old serpent, the devil and Satan, and binding him with that chain and casting him into that pit bound for a thousand years. He's bound with this great chain. A thousand years is his sentence. And here it's interesting because you see all monikers here of the devil. You see him as the dragon, that old serpent, the devil and Satan. And these are especially ones that are used in the book of Revelation. And so you can see from this, this portion of scripture, it ties them all together as the same creature, as that same devil, as that same Satan that deceiveth the whole world. Of course, he has other names throughout the Bible, but you can go study those out in your own time. These are called to remembrance, I believe, as the most prominent ones you'll really find in the book of Revelation. As you continue reading down to verse 3, it says, And cast him, so this is the binding of a thousand years, it says, It cast him into the bottomless pit, and shut him up, and set a seal upon him, that he should deceive the nations no more, till the thousand years should be fulfilled. And after that, he must be loosed a little season. So he's taken and thrown into the pit. He's shut up in the same. He's sealed so that he could not continue to do what he has been doing since the beginning of time, and that is deceive the nations. The Bible records, he shall deceive the nations no more until this thousand year sentence is up. Now it does show to us here at the very end of time, we're, we're two chapters away from the end of the Bible, the Satan still has basically the same manner and the same device. He's got no new tricks. He's going to continue to deceive. He's going to continue to bewitch. He's going to continue to swindle men by way of that craftiness that he has. So... His manner and device is deception among nations. And, and certain, certainly, the thing that I reflect on when I look at this is, do I really need the devil's help to be deceived? I, I don't think so. But it'll certainly be a, a nice break when the devil for that a thousand years isn't there to add fuel to the fire. Because certainly we as people, when we get into groups... It's pretty easy for us to confuse and deceive and mess with ourselves. It's pretty easy for me by myself in my own flesh to confuse and mess with and deceive my own self. My flesh is, is wicked and rotten enough, but add to it the fire that the devil has where he goes and he takes and manipulates masses to the end that whole nations would be deceived. It's going to be nice to have a thousand years where he's not able to do that. Of course, we are our own worst enemy in a lot of cases, right? And I believe that will carry over into the thousand years because you find near the end of this 
of this chapter that actually the devil comes back out, deceives the nations again, and it looks like the world just gets back into their old troubles, back into their old problems, and they just fall for the deception, and the thing just repeats itself. We're our own worst enemies, of course. But it will be nice to have a break from the, recu- the accuser of the brethren and him adding to our troubles. Now, here they're entering into an, a thousand-year time span. And I went and I, I've highlighted all these in red because I believe these are all saying the same thing. Verse 2, 1,000 years. Verse 3, 1,000 years. Verse 4, 1,000 years. Verse 5, 1,000 years, first resurrection. Verse 6, 1,000 years. Verse 7, 1,000 years. There's 1,000 years that is very clearly the theme of Revelation chapter 20, at least in the first portion of it. So, now... Here, they're entering into a thousand years, and I want to show you some scriptures that coincide with this. Keep your finger in Revelation chapter 20. Go to Revelation chapter 6. And in Revelation chapter 6, beginning in verse 9, it says, And when he had opened the fifth seal, I saw under the altar the souls of them that were slain for the word of God and for the testimony which they held. And they cried with a loud voice saying, How long, O Lord, holy and true, dost thou not judge and avenge our blood on them that dwell on the earth? And white robes were given unto every one of them. And it was said unto them that they should rest yet for a little season until the fellow servants and their brethren that should be killed as they were should be fulfilled. So it talks about brethren being killed as they were. Now, when I first read this, and I tried to study Revelation out in a chronological fashion. In other words, I didn't go and too often read ahead in order to explain stuff that was happening. I wanted it to more organically happen where kind of I'm, I'm understanding as much has been revealed to that time portion, but then waiting for God to reveal more of himself that I can work it back. And if you've noticed, as we're getting to Revelation 18, 19, 20, more and more we're starting to pull back and find clarity to the truths early on in scriptures. The one truth that really stood out to me is that statement, killed as they were at the end of verse 11. Killed as they were. Now, when I first read that, I thought killed also. I, I, I figured it was that they would also be killed, and that's what he's waiting for. But I believe that maybe it's not just that they would be killed also, but that they would be killed as they were. In other words, as the, in the same manner, in the same fashion, in the same act, they would be killed in that same fashion, in that same way. So... And, and I have scriptures for that. Now, Revelation 6, I believe, connects here to a time frame where there is a specific and structure, a structured and strategic persecution against believers. And if we notice there in the context of chapter 6, when you go down to verse 17, it says, For the great day of his wrath is come, and who shall be able to stand? Presently the, the wrath of God arrives. So, the persecution that we're seeing, these in, in heaven crying out, saying, how, Lord, how long, Lord, faithful and true, waiting for their brethren to be killed in the same manner as they were, immediately proceeds the wrath of God falling. And when that happens there, we find in verse 12, that seal opens and that whole wrath of God event is, is framed by those 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 time frame markers that we always find in scriptures, the sun and moon being darkened and the stars falling from heaven. Read that in 12 and in verse 13. So Revelation 13 then, we find that a mark is instituted, right? Revelation 13, and I I explained that I believe this is a second witness to events that had already transpired, probably back in the time frame of Revelation chapter 6 and verse 9 through 11, the fifth seal being opened, leading into the sun and moon being darkened and the return of Christ in chapter 7. Back there in Revelation 13, there is a mark instituted which calls upon a culling of those that would not accept it. Would you agree with that? Anybody who does not accept this mark is destroyed as a result of it. It says in verse 15, He had power to give life unto the image of the beast, that the image of the beast should both speak and cause as many as would not worship the image of the beast should be killed. So it's very specific. Don't worship the image. Don't receive his mark. You should be killed. Okay? So we have a killing happening in chapter 6, right before a great judgment, a culling of people that will not fall in line. We have Revelation 13 giving us more insight to what that entails, and that is worshiping of a beast and his image and receiving a mark in your right hand or in your forehead. 
And then it says, at this time, I think it would make sense when a worldwide mark is given that there would be a worldwide requirement to receiving the mark, right? Worship of the beast. I believe there would also be a worldwide punishment for not doing it. And it's not just being killed necessarily, but there's actually a specific punishment. Doesn't it make sense that there would be kind of a manner for these things? One law goes out and everybody says, okay, the mark is instituted. You must this or this happens. And it's probably just going to be very clear. You either choose this path or that path. You either take the mark or you die in a specific fashion. And I believe that's what the Bible reveals to us. I believe that there would be a specific, a structured, a strategic killing manner that all would die as those group cried out and said, how long? And Lord said, patiently wait until your brethren are killed as they were or in the same fashion, or in the same manner before them. And God is looking forward to that. Go to Revelation chapter 20 and verse 4. And it says, and I saw thrones. Okay, I saw thrones. Now it's interesting because Revelation chapter 6, it referred to, or God actually said to his saints, rest for a little season. Maybe he's saying, hey, take a seat on those thrones. Maybe he's saying, take a little break. Rest for a little season until your brethren are killed as you were. Okay, he says in verse 4, I saw thrones and they sat upon them. And judgment was given unto them. And I saw the souls of them that were beheaded okay so they're told to rest for a little season i believe sitting on those thrones and they sat and judgment was given well who was judgment given to well if you look back and in verse 9 the, the same group is mentioned there the souls revelation 6 and verse 9 says i saw under the altar the souls back in revelation chapter 20 and verse 4 it says they sat upon them judgment was given unto them who was it given to the souls of them that were what beheaded for the word of God, before beheaded for the witness of Jesus and for the word of God. So the souls of them, these souls are the ones that are specifically what? Beheaded. Why are they beheaded? It says very clearly for the witness of Jesus, go back to chapter six and it says they were slain for the word of God, chapter six, verse nine, and for the testimony which they held. It's the same people, the souls of them that were slain. Why? For the word of God and for the testimony which they held. Revelation 20 and verse four gives us more clarity to what happened to these souls that same manner that they would be killed as were their brethren before them is beheading very specifically is given the souls they the souls were beheaded why because of the witness of jesus and for the word of god so we have the witness of jesus pairing up with the testimony and what happens when you're giving witness to something you're testifying when we go and preach the gospel we're witnessing to people we're also giving the testimony of jesus unto them the same thing and the word of god that's just very clearly they're, they're persecuted here for the word of god beheaded for the same now, it continues on and says of these specifically in an inclusive fashion. Watch this. It says, and which had not worshipped, Revelation 20 and verse 4, right in the middle, and which had not worshipped the beast, neither his image, neither had received his mark upon their foreheads or in their hands. That's all an inclusive statement. They, the souls that were beheaded for the witness of Jesus and for the word of God. This verse gives us a lot of clarity about what happened back there in Revelation chapter 6. And I believe also Revelation chapter 13. There was a beheading that happened for those that would not worship the beast. Neither, inclusive, his image, neither received the mark in their foreheads or up upon their foreheads or in their right hands. All inclusive. They did none of those things and they were beheaded because they would not do any of them. Not even one. And so that is what happened. That was the judgment that the world put on them since they had not worshipped the beast or his image, neither received the mark in either of two places. They were beheaded because of the witness of Jesus and the word of God. It continues on and it says of they, the souls, it says, and they live, that last little uh, portion of the sentence, and they lived and reigned with Christ a thousand years 
years. So who? They, the souls that were beheaded, they lived, they reigned a thousand years with Christ. That's all in that context. It's all the same group and it's all the same actions and it's all the same refusals and what they did and what they had and what they rejected and, and who they were is all contained in this. So it continues on in verse five. It says, but the rest of the dead lived not again until the thousand years were finished. This is the first resurrection okay so the dead here it just refers to them in passing says they live not again until those thousand years were fulfilled okay but in the context we're still talking about who they the souls the ones that were alive lived and reigned with christ for a thousand years that's who's being talked about here in the greater context they were part of the first resurrection it says that statement this is the first resurrection well what is the first resurrection well we have they verse 4 that were given thrones judgment given unto them and i saw the souls of them that were beheaded for the witness of jesus and for the word which they held so they were alive at one point were they not and then beheading well that kills a man right they die that first death of course now Right after that, in the very next sentence, saying this is the first resurrection. So they, the souls, were beheaded, and then it says at the end, and they lived. There's your resurrection. They were alive. They died for the witness of Jesus and for the word of God. They lived and reigned with Christ a thousand years. This is the first resurrection in the context of the scriptures here. They lived and reigned. Now, of these, the group, it says, verse 6, talks a little bit more about them, blessed and holy is he that hath part in the first resurrection. On such the second death hath no power, but they shall be priests of God and of Christ and shall reign with him a thousand years. So it says of them that had part in this first resurrection, they are blessed and holy. It says the second death hath no power of them. It says that they are priests and they shall reign with him. They, the souls that were beheaded, died. They lived and reigned with Christ. Now, we got to ask ourselves now, is this mentioning, since it's been so specific and inclusive in what they did and who they are, and we can actually trace them through scriptures, is this actually sectioning and portioning and, and, and pulling aside a particular group for an, a particular and exclusive event? I believe this is mentioning one exclusive group of people who was brought to one challenge did not succumb to it and therefore received the reward, the gift of the thousand years. What did they do? One group was set out. They were put through a trial where they could choose the beast or his image or they could reject it for the word of God and the testament which they held. Die the martyr's death, right? And then have part of this first resurrection. I believe it's got a particular group here in mind. They received that thousand year reign and I think it's because of the trial that they went through and the overcoming which they had in that time. So Matthew chapter 24, you can go there. Revelation 20, keep your finger. In Matthew chapter 24, Again, we haven't gone too back into scriptures here and there, but Matthew 24 does give us a, a very clear walk through the last days. <clears throat> because the, the disciples in verse 3 specifically asked and came to him privately and said, Tell us, when shall these things be, and what shall be the sign of thy coming and of the end of the world? They're asking particularly regarding the last days, the end of the world. So in Matthew chapter 24, in verse 15, it says, when ye therefore shall see the abomination of desolation spoken by Daniel the prophet stand in the holy place, whoso readeth, let him understand, then let, him which, let them which be in Judea flee unto the mountains. Down in verse 21 it says, For then shall be great tribulation, such as was not since the beginning of the world to this time, no, nor ever shall be. There is a great tribulation a great event unmatched in all of human history that those that were in judea and flee from would be taking part in and that i believe is their challenge the abomination of desolation is set before them is that the image of the beast likely and when that image of the beast is set up standing in the holy place uh, a false prophet will say, worship this beast and his image, receive a mark in your right hand or in your forehead, or get beheaded, 
Okay, so he sets that before them. And then the Bible says and talks about fleeing. Those that are with child, pray, pray that you be not in that case. Flight, that it would not be in winter. This is going to be a great trial of God's people at this time. Obviously, honestly, too, probably just people in general that just don't want to get uh, involved in this type of a system. <clears throat> it says, For then shall be great tribulation, such as was not since the beginning of the world, nor no ever shall be. And verse 22 says, And except those days should be shortened, there should no flesh be saved. But for the elect's sake, those days should be shortened. So that event comes to a finality, I believe, a shortening at God's hand, in order that some could be saved and spared from being destroyed. Otherwise, no flesh would be saved. You continue down, and in verse 29, it says, Immediately after the tribulation of those days shall the sun be darkened, and the moon shall not give her light, and the stars shall fall from heaven. And it continues on. It says in verse 30, And then shall appear the sign of the Son of Man in heaven, and then shall all the tribes of the earth mourn, and they shall see the Son of Man coming in the clouds with great power and glory, and he shall send his angels with the sound of a great trumpet, and they shall gather together his elect from the four winds and from one end of heaven unto the other. Those that are elect at this time are those that are gathered that were spared dying in verse 22 and he, they were spared specifically for their sake that God shortened that time. So it continues on and, and that lines up perfectly with what we read in Revelation chapter 6 as well as Revelation chapter 13 as well as what we're experiencing when we see and we read about those in, in, in chapter 20. So these souls that were killed as they were in tribulation, right before the time when the sun and moon are darkening, I believe is the same people. And the challenge that is being placed before the specific group that is beheaded for the witness of Christ is the tribulation, is that great scattering, is basically the blitz of the Antichrist and his army when they basically just say, go, kill any of them. Kill all of them that will not take the mark. Bring them before it. See if they'll bow down. Of course, no believer is going to. But if they don't and they refuse, they're beheaded for the word of God and for the testimony which they held very specifically. And that is the great tribulation. And that is, I believe, believe the fifth seal and, and proceeding going into the sixth when when the sun and moon are darkened that is the same type of unveiling of the antichrist system that comes with revelation chapter 13 and that is the same group that is being referred to i believe in revelation chapter 20 and verse 4 it says they the souls were beheaded for their witness which they held and because they did not worship the beast and after they were killed they lived and reigned with christ a thousand years verse 5 in revelation chapter 20 it says but the rest of the dead lived not again until the thousand years for, were finished this is the first resurrection they were there that went through and died i believe during the great tribulation some survived this time we know and were gathered together at his coming and we read about this in the previous chapter. They received of the fine linen, right? Because they were raptured up. And obviously everybody that died before that, because doesn't the Bible say that you shall not prevent those which are asleep, but the dead in Christ rise first. Then we which are alive and remain, those elected at the end of the time, to alive, be alive and remain, are caught up together with them in the clouds. So shall they ever be with the Lord. Some that survive given fine linen, they eventually return as that great army to that marriage supper of the great God where God speaks them out of existence. And we talked about this last week. And when they're destroyed, the fowls of the air come and eat up the flesh of kings and of, and of their horses and so on and so forth. So <clears throat> the raptured and those that died before, okay, before the tribulation, the ones that raptured and lived through it, and those that died before the tribulation, are they then excluded from this event known as the first resurrection? I would say yes. Okay, because they're talking about very two specific groups at this time. Those that were elected, lived unto the end, rose. Those previous that were dead in Christ before the great tribulation, they went up first. The ones that survived the great tribulation went up ever with the Lord, given white um, linen, fine linen to wear, come as, as, the, as that group. And then there's the others that are living and reigning with Christ a thousand years. Verse 4, I believe, just like nails that. 
It says they, who, the souls, those that were beheaded. And then you can take verse 4 and just put it through the time frame of Revelation. You see that it's those that died, that lived again, reigned and ruled with Christ a thousand years. So then, if we go up in the rapture, if we die tomorrow... We're not included in the millennium then, right? Oh, we're out. Sorry. No, I don't think so. I just think that we have a different role in that, okay? And I'll show you. Now, a lot of people will be like, oh, you know, I won't be part of this millennium. This is no good. This is no fun. Like, I'm being excluded for something. But no, God has specific plans for specific people. And this is why he draws up groups at different times and outlines what his intent is with them. Being beheaded for the witness of Christ isn't a fun thing, but I've thought to myself that maybe that's not the worst way to go, but certainly the trial going up before that, I mean, I've heard people say that, you, you know, you can, you can still see after you're beheaded and your head's alive for a certain amount of time. I don't know how anyone can prove that, but I, I've heard that because that was a common method of execution in the, in the Middle Ages. People did studies on that because I, everyone got freaked out when the head fell. They, would, they, could, they could see, you know, the eyes moving and stuff. I, I don't want to go into that too much. But I, I've thought about how bad beheading was, and I think that versus, like, torture and other things, that's probably not the worst way to go. But those that are brought to that challenge in the time of tribulation and are beheaded for the witness of Christ, they're given a special reward for that, and that's to, to be blessed. That's to be holy, he says, or separate or distinct. It says that the second death hath no power, and I don't believe the second death has power on anybody that is saved. But it also says that they shall be priests of God and of Christ and shall reign with him for a thousand years. And that's their part. So, the first thing, if you're not included in the people that are beheaded for the witness of Christ during the time of tribulation, you got to rejoice just in the fact that you're in heaven. Now, who's going to be complaining when they're in heaven and not privy to, you know, going through this tribulation and beheaded as a result? Ultimately, everybody who's died from the time of tribulation forward is all going to be in this distinct group that rises with Christ and, 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 uh, and becomes part of his army at this time. We can't complain when we're in heaven, of course. And I don't think anybody, because we've also fantasized about this, right, and thought about, you know, what would it be like to live through the bombs and the explosions and the attacks and the beheadings and then, and then be raptured up with Christ. That would be a great thing. And then you're raptured with Christ and you're like, he's like, you're not part of the first resurrection. You're like, oh, what a ripoff. Like, I don't, nobody's going to be saying that. We'll have different roles, but we're not going to have anything to complain about in those different parts is what I believe I'm seeing here. So Revelation first, read Revelation 20 and verse 21. It says, And I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth was passed away, and there was no more sea. So in order for there to be a new one, the old had to pass away. So there there had to be that change taking place. Okay? So if we continue on, I want to keep your place in Revelation 20. Go a few pages back to 2 Peter. And in 2 Peter, I just want to define, yes, we have those that are beheaded for the witness of Christ, rule and reign with him a thousand years. They're priests unto him, and that's their job. That's their lot. They were beheaded, and they're rewarded in this way. But there's the other group then that died beforehand or was raptured, having survived all of the tribulation and the beheadings that went on. Now, if you look quickly to 2 Peter chapter 3 and verse 7, it says, But the heavens and the earth, which are now by the same word are kept in store, reserved unto fire against the day of judgment and perdition of ungodly men. And so everything that we see now is reserved in store for the day of judgment. We already read Revelation chapter 20 in its context, and we find that right after we deal with the first resurrection comes that great white throne of judgment. And so everything is reserved in store for that day and then you turn the page and there's a new heaven and a new earth meaning that this was fulfilled which is discussed in second peter chapter 3 and verse 7 now look in verse 8 and and this has always confounded me <laughs> it says in verse 8 but beloved be not ignorant of this one thing okay if there was ever a statement to make that you just got to zone in on and say okay i need to not be ignorant of this thing it's this because god's just outright saying it don't be ignorant of this one thing that one day is with the Lord as a thousand years and a thousand years as one day. 
And I'm just like, well, that's a conundrum because it's just saying the opposite thing. A, a day is as a thousand years, a thousand years is, is one day. I've always just thought, well, that's just God indicating that he's outside of, of time. Time has no effect on him. And when you're with him, you'll have that same perspective. You're not going to be counting 60 seconds for a minute and then adding them up until you get to a thousand. It's going to be different. A day is a thousand, a thousand as one day. I think that's indicating a relativity of time, and we've discussed that a little bit as we've gone through Revelation, where sometimes things don't seem to be chronological in their presentation, because things that go on in heaven, they're basically non-consequential to our 24-hour day. There's nothing that binds heaven to our 24-hour time frame, and I believe that's what God is saying. Now, is then, when Christ explains that those that are part of the first resurrection ruling and reigning for a thousand years here upon earth is that indicating that the rest of us will just be twiddling our thumbs in the sidelines for a thousand years no because a thousand years with the lord it says right one day is with the lord is a thousand years and a thousand years as one day maybe this is just a heaven and earth perspective a thousand years will pass on earth and that ruling and reigning will go on and it might be just a day for those that have been raptured away, caught up with the Lord in the air, just passing as a day. It's, it's of no significance, no con It's not like you're being sidelined, put on a shelf while God goes and deals with another group of people for a while. No, it's not gonna, it's not gonna be that way to us. That's, that's what I see here. So first of all, if you're caught up with Christ, being the dead in Christ that rise first or being alive and remaining unto the coming of the Lord, you can't complain because you're in heaven. You're also not going to complain because time isn't going to be that same kind of fashion. It's not going to confound you and you'll be just like, oh man, when is their rule and reign going to be over and I can get into the fight? You'll be in the fight from moment one. That's what I believe. So you're in the Lord's army. That's the third point. The third point from those that are raptured. Go to Matthew chapter 22. I believe that you will be in the fight from moment one because when you are caught up together with the Lord, you are immediately given white, th white garments and you are immediately enlisted in his great army. Matthew chapter 22. I'm just taking my time getting there, I guess. Matthew chapter 22. Just like the sound of pages turning. Matthew chapter 22 and in verse 23, let's read. It says, the same day came to him the Sadducees, which say there is no resurrection, and asked him, saying, Master, Moses said, if a man die, having no children, and his brother shall marry his wife and raise up seed unto his brother, now there were with us seven brethren. And the first, when he had married a wife deceased and having no issue, left his wife unto his brother. Likewise, the second also, and the third, and the seventh. And last of all, that woman died also. Now, first of all, when somebody comes at you with these hypotheticals, just dismiss it and walk away. Okay, but Christ answers it correctly. And, and he answers it vaguely to them, but with great spiritual significance and consequence to us. He gives a great truth that probably went right over their wicked heads, but praise the Lord that we have a truth coming out of this. These hypotheticals, they're, they're vain jangling. They don't, they don't go anywhere. They're only meant to deceive, especially coming from a group that denies the resurrection when we have a whole chapter in 1 Corinthians where it discusses the resurrection. We call it the resurrection, 1 Corinthians 15, the resurrection chapter. We're now reading about the first resurrection in Revelation. Anyways, I digress. So... Therefore, they ask in verse 28, in the resurrection, which they don't believe in, whose wife shall she be of the seven? For they all had her. Jesus answered and said unto them, ye do err, not knowing the scriptures nor the power of God. For, watch this, in the resurrection they neither marry nor are given in marriage, but are as the angels of God in heaven. Okay? So God is indicating that those that are part of the resurrection in heaven are as the angels of God in the resurrection, not part of the resurrection necessarily, but in that risen state, once they have been caught up together with the Lord, okay, they are as the angels which are in heaven. And so this is what, this is what I think is happening here. Back in 2 Peter, you can go there, 
Or no, go to Hebrews chapter 2. Hebrews chapter 2. <clears throat> and I'll read for you. And that phrase I wanted to grab a hold of was, as the angels. You are as the angels. As you're going to Hebrews chapter 2, let me read for you 2 Peter chapter 2. It says, God spared not the angels that sinned, but cast them down into hell and delivered them into chains of darkness to be reserved unto judgment. Revelation chapter 20 in the first portion was was precursor to the judgment. That was when the chains were, were, uh, were taken and Satan was bound and thrown into the depths for a thousand years. So at this time, I believe Hebrews chapter 2 and verse 5 is what we're finding. It says in Hebrews chapter 2 and verse 5, it says, For unto the angels, for unto the angels hath he not put in subjection the world to come, which we speak. So this is specifically mentioning that the angels will not be over the world to come that they're talking about right now. So when that first resurrection takes place and there is that group ruling and reigning with Christ for a thousand years, it's saying here that the angels will not be over that. That world, which is to come, will not be in subjection unto them. But who will it be in subjection unto? Well, look at verse 6. But want one in a certain place testified, saying, What is man that thou art mindful of him, or the son of man that thou visitest him? Thou madest him a little lower than the angels. Thou crownedst him with glory and honor, and didst set him over the works of thy hands. Thou hast put all things in subjection under his feet. And it begins to talk about what is man, what is the son of man, what are men in general that you would build them and make them a little lower than the angels, but then crown them with glory and set things under subjection under their feet. And then he begins to talk about Christ in particular. Okay? I believe he's referring to men. Who? They, the souls that were beheaded for the word of God and the testimony which they have, who are reigning and ruling with Christ for that 1,000 years. It is those that have the world in subjection under them, which world, verse 5 says, the world to come whereof we speak. Now, what of the angels? What of those, I believe, let's talk about now the army that is raptured, that is dead in Christ when they rise first. Those that Matthew chapter 22 gives us a little indication that when people die at that resurrection time, they shall be as the angels. What of them? Hebrews chapter 1 and verse 14, it says, Are they not all ministering spirits sent forth to minister for them who shall be heirs of salvation? Right before that, it says, Which the angels said he at any time, Sit on my right hand until I make thine enemy thy footstool. In other words, come sit and rule and reign with me on this throne. Which had I say to that at any time? The angels instead are ministering spirits set forth with what purpose? To minister for them who shall be the heirs of salvation. Now, I believe that in function and even in replacement, do you remember that that time came in, he, or in, in 2 Peter chapter 2 where God spared not the angels but cast them down? Remember how it talked about the devil using his tail to draw a third part of the angels and bring them down to earth with them? Those angels that rebelled? I believe those angels, just as Satan did, gave up their place. And I believe it's possible that those that are resurrected, or sorry, those that are raptured, those that are caught up together to meet the Lord in the air, before and after the time of tribulation, those are caught up and replaced, or at least function as angels during that time where those that are heirs of salvation, those that have been um, given opportunity to rule and reign with Christ as priests, those that had actually received that charge, those men that, that sit on my right hand until I make thine enemies my footstool, those that have been given power over the world which is to come, subjection then made beneath them, I believe it's those that have that position and it's the rest that have the opportunity to during those thousand years perform as ministering spirits unto the salvation. And during that thousand years, there will be people getting saved. There will be, there will be people 
uh, you know, functioning in, 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 as kings and priests unto God. And there will be a whole different economy that goes on in the world during that thousand years. Christ will be the head and he will mandate and dictate and rule and reign with an iron fist over all those after him. But we will, those that are raptured, I believe, I, I just say don't be surprised if you're given angelic roles at that time in their place in their position in their responsibility to minister over those that are ruling and reigning for those a thousand years two different groups i believe are clearly taught and i believe that's in in my mind that's what is going to be the position and we don't need to just be surprised about that as if it's some fantastical thing because how many times do we find even in the chapter right previous to uh, Revelation 20 and Revelation 19, we find John falling at the feet of one that says, whoa, 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 I am just a man. What about in the times of Sodom and Gomorrah when the angels came, but they looked exactly like men? What about the time when the Bible says, be not, be not forgetful to entertain strangers, for some have un unknowingly, right, entertained angels how many times do you find in the scripture you know when uh when when somebody is given an angelic form and they actually say even in revelation don't worship me i'm of your brethren i'm just one of you and i believe that's going to be the position held by those that aren't martyred during the great tribulation they will be given that angelic role to minister to people they'll be one of the, some of those ones in revelation that are going to the apostle john and, and 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 transcending time to give him that vision of everything that's coming to pass and they think whoa, whoa whoa don't worship me we might be going personally to some 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 saint on earth that's in a time of trouble revealing something unto them and then saying to them too i'm of your brethren please don't don't worship me all right I'm just a ministering spirit. I'm just an angel. And those, those two terms often are, are, are exchanged one for another. So that's what I believe is happening. So just because there's a specific group that went through, that, that was, was destroyed during great tribulation, and they are given the opportunity to rule and reign with Christ for a thousand years, doesn't exclude the whole history of people and those that die afterwards. They'll be given, who knows, some of us might think that's an even cooler role. <laughs> to be in heaven and ministering down upon earth, to seeing things from, from angelic point of views and being having angelic powers. You'll be given a position, and it will be a great position no matter what it is. Ruling and reigning with Christ or ministering to those that are ruling and reigning with Christ. With Christ, in Christ, serving Christ as part of his army or as part of his legion of saints upon earth. Hey, either way, it's a great job. And I believe the Bible here is giving us indication of both of those potentials. Go study it yourself. Be fully persuaded in your own mind. These things aren't always crystal clear, but I believe this is a good indication of what the Scriptures is trying to tell us about these two groups. Revelation 20 and verse 4, I believe, makes it clear as it draws into chapter 5, or verse 5, and says, This is the first resurrection, and it's they, the souls that were beheaded for the witness of Jesus and for the word of God, which had not worshipped the beast neither his image neither received his mark on their foreheads or in their hand they died of course being beheaded it says and they lived and reigned with christ a thousand years and right after that this is the first resurrection and blessed are they those received that but blessed are you if you die today absent from the body present with the lord you're not going to complain it's going to be a wonderful sight just to be with christ and just to say what will thou have me to do what what's next what should i do sir and, and and just just bow down and worship the god of heaven and just 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 you know be with him and under him and perform exactly what's intended at that time